Many thanks for the invitation to uh, Renata Avila, uh, my friend Renata Avila originally, but also to Simona. I'm really pleased to be here, and uh, it's an honor to speak at the end of today's conference, especially as I'm not a specialist researcher on education, but I am a teacher. I teach in a university, and I care deeply about education, and I care about the extraction of data, and as our friend at the front said, metadata, from educational settings. Now, the bad news is that I'm afraid I don't build anything. I don't make anything. I just do ideas, so sorry. Um, the second thing is, the second piece of bad news is that I had to prepare these slides on Monday before I knew what we were going to hear today. Especially, I knew nothing about the wonderful DD. I was in the dark as you were. So, um, I feel almost like a comedian coming at the end of a long comedy festival, but a comedian who can't tell any jokes. So I'm sorry, <laughs> you'll just have to accept what I'm going to give you. Um, now, what I'm going to be doing, therefore, is gonna, I'm going to take us back to the dark side that Simona mentioned that you covered yesterday. But I'm going to try and think about the dark side um, in terms of some underlying principles, which maybe will help us decide on what the parameters should be as we now think about the brighter side that we want to stay on. So I hope my comments will be useful uh, in preparing for tomorrow's workshop on the recommendations, uh, very important recommendations for a new legal framework uh, outlined by Cecilia Bayo this morning. And in a sense, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and build for us a bridge from the dark side, which I know more about, I've lived on the dark side for about 10 years, seeing the bad side of all this, to the bright side, so that we can make sure we get back to the bright side when we go back into the world. Because it's mainly dark, let's be honest. So we need a bridge. So I'm gonna think about what is that bridge that takes us from the dark side we know is, has trillions of dollars behind it, and the bright side we want to get back to next year, next decade, and so on. Okay, what I want to do is to remind us first of all to, that it's half a century now since the Austrian Ivan Illich wrote his book, Deschooling Society, and he spent a lot of his career um, actually in a Spanish-speaking country, of course, in Mexico, and he wrote in Spanish. That book protested against the instrumentalization of education. It protested, maybe in a way we don't agree with now, against over-specialization. More fundamentally, he protested against the suppression of freedom in an over-technical education. And above all, he protested against the suppression of the imagination, the ability to imagine the future in the process that is meant to be about creating the future creating the next generation in a bad education, a badly managed education. Now, we all know that Illich's very bold ideas were not put into practice. We still have schools, so Illich failed in one sense. But I think that doesn't make the underlying idea behind his book any less important today, because the fundamental idea was that education is a social process and citizens must decide what manages it, not businesses. But then we must remember that Illich's worries 50 years ago almost seemed trivial compared with what we're worried about, the dark side we face today in today's schools and universities. We're worried, but Illich wasn't, about the continuous tracking of students in space and time. We're worried, but Illich wasn't, about the continuous monitoring of student bodies, the tracking, the analyzing of their emotions as they sit in class, as they do assignments. Illich could never have imagined something that dark, but he was still unhappy, right, 50 years ago. 
We're worried about the continuous tracking of the process of study on tra platforms. And even if, as, as I've heard, all the wonderful new proposals, I did hear some hints that we might still be tracking students. So I'm suggesting we need to go on thinking about what, whether and how far we should be tracking them, what the limits should be. I'll come back to that at the end. All of which, and here I'm just drawing on 10 years of brilliant critical literature by academics and teachers in the UK, US, Australia, Italy, Switzerland, Sweden, and so on. We're getting to the point where many people are worried that outside this room, outside Catalonia, the rest of the world is transforming education into a business product, into a continuous automated management of students for fixed commercial goals that of course generate profit and maybe also generate more controllable students, order, which is what the bureaucrats want in schools, but they do not necessarily generate a better education. And just to emphasize what I'm not saying, because of course during the pandemic I used Moodle myself to do my own teaching, I'm not suggesting there's anything darkly suspicious about having digital tools. I'm talking about the con corporate control of all the other parameters of education. That's what I'm concerned about. Let me give you, just to remind you again, if you've forgotten of the dark side, just two American examples, which are mainly from the higher education sector where I work, they're just symptomatic. Um, there are similar things happening in the UK and of course at all levels of education. Here's one company picked up recently by the New York Times in the piece, Spotter EDU, that celebrates how it uses the fact that every student carries a phone to track them wherever they are on campus. So no need for registers. Um, they're just going to be tracked. And here's the description on the website. We use iBeacons, which is what you also use in supermarkets, incidentally, to track your phone to give you a discount as you approach the uh, cornflakes, which they know you like. Um, iBeacons in classrooms allowing us to record continuous, reliable, and non-invasive attendance. And it means non-invasive because it's intended to invade. It is invading, of course but the students don't know unless they read the website. That's the first example. And we know there are much worse examples across the world. So we know uh, that facial recognition is the normal way of doing this in China and in some parts of the West. Uh, that is invasive. Second example, a broader strategy of data gathering from an American company called Degree Analytics. Again, in the university sector, but the basic principle is one that applies to schools too, surely. It's the idea of providing a frictionless, automated approach to quantify the student experience. But I want to ask a very simple question of this business. Is a quantified student experience exactly what we want? Is there a risk that unless we as citizens control this process of quantifying the student experience, that it could end up narrowing the student experience, distorting our view of what education is and what education could become. Now, these two US companies are just a small part, obviously, a much larger transformation going on and affecting all levels of education that is characterized by basically a complete gulf, a chasm between the ed tech, pra the commercial ed tech practices, the datification of education for profit, and the concerns they're raising amongst critical researchers, critical educators like yourselves. And yet, at the same time, we see that the shift to continuous data collection in schools and universities goes on being celebrated by those same corporations that promote and benefit from it. I want to give you two examples of the broader way they justify going on what they're doing. Because for sure, they will go on what they're doing at the end of this conference. They're, they've been doing it today, they will be doing it tomorrow. How do they justify it, given what we know could be problematic about this? Well, 
Let me take one English company, but it's Global Reach, Pearson Education. Very interesting paper from eight years ago called The Impacts of the Digital Ocean on Education, where they compare the school as it was up till around 2010. They call that, and maybe you were teaching in one, they call that the digital desert. The digital desert, when data collection and storage was expensive, limited, and isolated, and there was no systematic large-scale way to monitor outcomes. Well, no one wants a desert, obviously. So what we then have to have is the digital ocean, which in their vision, they control. It's a world, the digital ocean, where the data collection is ubiquitous and persistent, and it reflects social connection. So they argue that it's, it's like the, the ocean, it's completely natural, and it fits in with kids' natural conception of the way the world is. It's socially connected, of course. So what could be wrong? It's just natural. This is a very common ideological trick. But the corporate rhetorics like those of Pearson, um, which offer these changes as dramatically positive, have, of course, been intensified in the years since Pearson wrote that paper because of the global pandemic we've been talking about, when necessarily digital platforms played an essential role in enabling us to go on connecting to our students. No one has any doubts about that. So let's look at this thinking as it was updated for the uh, pandemic. Here's a paper by Microsoft, Microsoft researchers called Education Reimagined from June 2020. So this was a very quick position paper they produced to respond to the challenge of the pandemic, where they interpret our shift to online learning as signaling a permanent shift to what they call deep learning. Again, who can imagine deep learning or a digital ocean that's deep? You, you can't object to this. Let's see how they describe it. Deep learning takes our best selves, that is a hybrid of synchronous, non-synchronous, virtual bricks and mortar, etc., embracing effective pedagogies, partnerships, environments, digital, to allow all learners to access, understand, create, co-create, refine new knowledge. It's the basis of a new educational paradigm. So they're trying to reset our educational values two years ago, given the pandemic, for the future. Because it allows teachers and learners to pursue possibilities previously out of reach for all but a few learners. So it's also democratizing. So this is deep, it's democratizing, it brings together everything we believe in. Well, you'd be crazy not to sign up to Microsoft, wouldn't you? You really would be crazy. Um, except you, unless you thought about the costs of this. So let me summarize the costs on the dark side. I know you know this, but let's just summarize them to remind ourselves of these costs. This vision of Microsoft, of, of course, Google in its suite of, of, of educational tools, of Apple, and so on and so forth. This vision of a paradise of data-rich, educational, personalized tools has some big costs. It is dependent on the continuous personalized tracking or surveillance, data extraction from young people. Do we want a society where that's the way things are? Of course, schools have always involved looking, monitoring students, but in a way that's modulated by caring for them and controlling how you surveil them. This is a total system for total surveillance. That's the idea, because if it's not functioning, that's not good. So it has to be total surveillance, number one. Second principle is that this is controlled, of course, by external platforms not by teachers, not by the managers of the schools, it's external corporate control of platforms, algorithms, and data. And then we know similar developments are going on in the legal sector, many other sectors of society. School is just one of them. This is based not on consultation with parents and students, it's based around assuming their consent because it's just a soft, it's just a click. Do you accept terms and conditions? And maybe you didn't do that. Maybe it was the manager of the school who did it, who runs the budget. So you didn't even know they consented. But you've consented, because where else are you gonna take your kids? 
There's no, op there's no option. And this has very uncertain long-term implications for us as teachers. Where is the authority of the teacher in all of this? Massive infrastructure. Where is the expertise of the teacher? How is it re still respected under these new conditions? Does Google think about that? Does it care about that? And this must have uncertain long-term implications for our educational values. I don't think we can ignore these transformations of education, the dark side. We have to think about the dark side because they're not technical changes. Uh, I'm not a technician, I'm a social theorist. This is a transformation not of a software, not of hardware, it's a transformation of society being engineered without consent. So I care about it as a member of society. We have to care about this. These are real and deep changes. So the question is, and we've been discussing it all day, can we do better? And how do we think about the task of doing better, all of us together? I want to go back to Ivan Illich. I know he's a favorite writer of mine. You may have forgotten him, not, not like Illich, but he wrote a very interesting book in 1973 called Tools for Conviviality. I think it was first written in English, but there was an uh, excellent Spanish translation the next year, La Convivencialidad, which means, uh, if you don't speak Spanish, some of us here who don't, it means, it's a beautiful word because it means the ability to go on living together is much better than conviviality, which just means having a great time at a party. It's a much more powerful word. Convivencialidad is a beautiful word. So that's the real translation of this. Um, I don't know whether there's a Catalan edition. If there is, please tell me. I'd like to know. But I couldn't find one when I looked. Okay, let's look at what Illich says about his core principles. He writes that convivencial es la sociedad en la que el hombre controla la herramienta. So a convivial society is one in which humanity controls its tools and where la herramienta está al servicio de la persona integrada a la colectividad, where the tool is always at the service of the individual, the person who is at the same time integrated and therefore cares about the collective. This is very simple but very deep principle from which it must follow that the control of commercial ed tech has to be co collective, it must be social, it cannot be allowed to be commercial because that would be live in a society where we cannot go on living together. And that was the message of his book. We will not go on living together successfully unless we have convivial tools missed in the English translation, which says tools for conviviality, which is not exactly what the book was about. It was about tools for living together better, which is a much bigger principle. The goal, therefore, of controlling EdTech has to be to strengthen society, not to increase corporate profit, and fundamentally, following from Illich, it has to be to increase, to grow autonomia. Personal autonomy of students, the autonomy of the community as a democratic entity, the autonomy of the school, and the spread of the value of autonomy across society. That's what Illich, I think, would have argued if we were alive today in thinking about ed tech. So as we think about how to challenge the commercial values of most ed tech, it's interesting also to look at a more recent example, which is from Chile, and looking at their draft constitution. I looked at that uh, the other week. Uh, a friend sent me um, uh, his version of, of, of the full text. We sent it to tra English translation on Twitter, a, a, Ch a Chilean friend, but I also got the Spanish version. And this is what it says about education, Article 35. That education is a right, it's the state's duty to provide it, and the goals of education, las fines de la educación, are la construcción del bien común, the construction of the common good, social justice, respect for human rights and nature, la conciencia ecológica, la convivencia democrática entre los pueblos, 
Okay, referring to the specific issue with indigenous peoples in Chile, but the word convivencia is there, which is the key thing. Democratic living together amongst people. And let's face it, we have enough conflict today, so we do need convivencia democratica entre los pueblos, en todos países. So, this idea in the Chilean constitution, and I know those of you who know Chilean politics will realize this may not be approved by the Chilean people in the referendum later in the year. Uh, that's sad, but it's still an inspiration potentially for us. This is the idea of education, as with Illich, as a fundamentally social, not, never, a commercial process. Because it's the use of society's common resources to train and to form its next generation. How could we allow corporations to take over that task? How could we delegate that to corporations whose goal is explicitly not social good, but commercial good? This was almost crazy, but this is what most of the world has been doing for 20, 30 years. So, let me run through finally one or two practical implications of these principles. First of all, I think it means that we need in every community, in every country, an open conversation about not just why they want ed tech, but whether they want ed tech. Maybe they don't. And if they do want it, where do they not want it to be operating? Are there limits? We'll come back to that. Why do they want it? What are the social goals for which they want DD? That needs to be clarified as the community defines it. Secondly, strengthening that, going beyond just having a nice conversation, there should be no ed tech in schools at all without full community consent, full teacher consent. We know that didn't exactly happen in the pandemic, but it was a bit of a rush, let's be honest. But there's no reason not to get consent at this point. Now we're no longer, hopefully, in the pandemic. Third principle is that if we clarify in each community the social goals for introducing ed tech on their own terms, then these should be translated into legal principles underwritten by the state which control issues of data storage, privacy protection, etc. all the things built into DD, but will not be built into other systems unless there is legal compulsion. Fourthly, a clear agreement in every community on what the limits of ed tech's role should be. Maybe we need a legal limit, a law, which says that an external corporation will not use its analysis capacities to track the emotions by studying the face of a child. Maybe we'd think this is incompatible with a democracy. I think it should be. But in, I've read, I, could, I have a paper in my folder of academic papers from American researchers who are selling technologies for tracking efficiently and spotting when the child has, has what they call um, mind wandering. By the way, I don't possess this technology myself, so I haven't been able to work out if you've been wandering your mind during my talk, I hope not, but this is the idea that the highest brains in educational psychology are working on. Mind-wandering technique. And in the paper, they worry about one thing that's even worse, internal thoughts, which could be causing the mind-wandering after all. Maybe the lecture is boring, and you're thinking about something different. So, we may need limits. And the fundamental point here, which is where I end, is that all these principles should be based on an underlying normative principle, which I think goes back to the great thinking of uh, uh, Illich, but also Paulo Freire in Brazil, of course, which is that schools are not places to run a business. They are places of community development. They're institutions where we grow freedom. They're not factories of the mind to be managed by businesses in the interest solely of greater efficiency to generate better flows of profit. The point of education is not just to create order, it is to free our next generation for a better future. And that's why we have to support the proposals of this 
wonderful conference, but we have to go on thinking about why, because otherwise the risk is that the ocean will flow over us and we'll be drowned. So we need principles to survive that. Thank you very much.